Hi, and welcome to Evaluating Poker Hands. My name is Jan, and I'll be your host tonight. I have more than 10 years of experience in all forms of development, mostly focused on the web, and I've also been playing poker for over 10 years. Let's get started by looking at the definition of a poker hand. A poker hand is a set of five cards. These sets uh, have certain ranks, and between these ranks, usually you have a stronger and a weaker hand, but ties are possible. And the value depends on the rules of the game that you're playing. We're going to be looking at Texas Hold'em Poker exclusively in this talk, which features 13 card ranks from Deuce to Ace, that is uh, cards ranks Deuce through 10, and then a Jack, Queen, King, and an Ace. We have four suits, clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. And an Ace can be used as the lowest card when used in a straight, that is in a straight from Ace to 5. Let's take a look at the hand values. The highest hand value that you can make is a Royal Flush. A Royal Flush is five consecutive cards of the same suit ending in an ace. If you have five consecutive cards of the same suit, but you have a different card rank that the sequence ends in, it's called a straight flush. The highest straight flush is the Royal Flush. And then afterwards you have the straight flush ending in the king and then a straight flush ending in the queen, and so on and so forth, until you end up with the lowest possible straight flush that ends in a 5. The next highest hand value is 4 of a kind. As the name implies, you have 4 of a kind. That is 4 cards of the same rank. The fifth card is whatever other rank you happen to have in your hand. When comparing 4 of a kind between each other, uh, the higher rank of the 4 of a kind uh, is considered a stronger hand and if you happen to have two hands that include the same four of a kind then the hand with the highest so-called kicker that is the fifth card wins so for example if you have four nines and a six you would beat four nines and a five but you would lose two four nines and a seven the third highest hand value is the full house also called a full boat at times and it's basically three cards of the same rank, and then two cards of uh, another rank. Ties are resolved in the following way. First, you compare the rank of the three of the kind. If that is the same, then you compare the rank of the two of the kind. That is, three sixes and two jacks is a better hand than three sixes and two tens, but is a worse hand than three sevens and two threes. The next hand that we're going to look at is the flush. A flush is a combination of five cards of the same suit and flushes are compared against one another by looking at the highest rank. If the highest rank happens to be the same, we look at the second rank and so on and so forth until we end up at the lowest rank. If the lowest rank is also equal, then the flushes will have the same strength and will tie against one another. Next, we're going to look at the straight. Straight is a set of five cards that have consecutive ranks. That is, for example, the straight that we see here has the five consecutive ranks ace, two, three, four, and five, and is also incidentally the lowest straight possible. Straights are compared against one another by comparing the card that they end in, that is, the card that is used for the high end. It means the highest straight possible ends in an ace, and the next highest straight ends in a king, and so on and so forth, until we get to the straight that we see here. One thing to note with straights is that we use the same card values as a straight flush. The difference to a straight flush is that in a straight, not all cards have the same suit. The next hand value that we're going to have to look at is three of a kind. Rever kind uses three cards of the same rank and then two cards of distinct other ranks. Three of a kinds compare against one another by first taking a look at the rank of the three of a kind. Whichever is higher is considered stronger. Should it be the same rank, then we look at the next highest card in the hand. If that is the same, then we'll look at the last one. If that is also the same, the hands are considered equal. Otherwise, the hand that uses the higher card is considered stronger. Next comes the two pairs. Two pairs, as the name implies, uses two distinct sets of 
ranks of which there are two items each and then we use one card to fill up the hand. Two pairs are compared against one another by first taking a look at the rank of the higher pair, then the rank of the lower pair, and then the rank of the kicker card. Next, we have the one pair hand. One pair hand, as the name implies, uses two cards of the same rank and then three more cards of distinct ranks. Comparing one pair hands against one another, we first take a look at the hand that has the higher pair. Then we look at the rank of the next highest card, and then the rank of the next highest card, and then the rank of the last hand. If any of those are higher, then that hand is considered stronger. If all of them are the same, the hands are considered equal. And last, and also least, we have what's called a high card hand. High card hands have no pair, are not a straight, and are not a flush. We compare high card hands against one another, by looking at the highest rank, and then the second highest rank, the third highest rank, and so on and so forth. Whichever hand can show a higher rank in any slot is considered higher. One thing to note, all high card hands use the same card values as flushes, the difference being that a high card hand uses at least two suits, whereas a flush hand obviously only uses one suit for all the cards. Now using everything that we've just learned, let's define a concept that is called relative hand value. Given two hands, we would want to be able to determine which one is the stronger one. Let's look at an example. Let's take for example this hand and the second hand. And as we can see at the top, we have a pair of fours and at the bottom, we have a pair of sixes. And as we just learned, the pair of sixes is the stronger hand. Now, what would we do if we only have one hand to consider? That is, let's say we only have one hand at a certain point in time and maybe we want to compare it to another hand at a later point in time. Well, we would need something that we can define as an absolute hand value. So for example, looking at five cards, we would be able to assign a numerical value. In this case, for example, 5555. And we would want this numerical value to have certain properties. We would want, for example, to define that lower values are considered stronger. So for example, we could define that uh, a royal flush would have hand rank one and then a straight flush with a king at the end would have rank two and so on and so forth. In order to understand the complexity of the problem that we're dealing with, let's take a look at the combinations that are possible so say we want to choose 5 cards from 52, that means for the first card we can choose from 52 cards. For the second card, since we've already chosen one, we can only choose from 51 cards, and so on and so forth. That leads us to 52 factorial over 47 factorial combinations, which ends up working out to around 312 million possible combinations. Now that is a quite a huge number. Let's look at how we can simplify things. The first aspect that we want to look at is the order of cards. Based on our computation here, if we take a look at this hand and compare it to this hand, we would be looking at different combinations based on our calculation previously, but as we can fairly obviously determine based on the definitions that we've seen so far, these hands are actually the same. So in order to simplify this and uh, come up with a calculation that takes this aspect of the order not being important into consideration, what we would want to do is we want to divide by the amount of possible combinations that these five cards that we choose can have given their order. As the math works out, we have five factorial combinations that are possible to arrange five cards in five slots. So given that knowledge, we can basically take the number that we came up with before and divide it by 5 factorial. There's also a different way of writing this, which we can see here, which is uh, commonly read as 52 choose 5. That is to indicate we're choosing 5 our elements out of 52, uh, ignoring the order. And then we see that we end up with about 2.6 million combinations. The second aspect that we want to look at to simplify the problem is what I like to call hand value classes. For example, let's take a look at the hand of four queens and the ten of diamonds. 
and compare it to the second hand of also four queens and a ten with the ten of clubs. Based on the definitions that we encountered previously, it is fairly obvious that these hands are in the same hand value rank. Even though they are considered unique, they are not distinct. Based on this concept, we can simplify quite a bit. Now, imagine that out of the 2.5 million combinations that we computed previously, we would find 2.5 million people and deal one of these combinations to each one of them. In this example, the upper hand would be dealt to one person and the lower hand would be dealt to another person. Now, if we were going from the top and would ask persons to step forward at a time, starting with, for example, the royal flushes, we would uh, see four people coming forward. Then we would like to ask the people who have uh, straight flushes that end in the king to step forward. And again, four people would step forward. And each time we ask people to step forward, we're going basically to the next lowest hand rank, and a certain amount of people will step forward. So for our example here, for the four queens and the ten, we would also encounter four people based on the suits of the ten. So in order to generalize this example, we can define that combinations have the same hand value if they are in the same result class. And each result class is a distinct combination as shown in the table in the right hand column. And each of these distinct combinations has a certain of unique combinations, right? So the unique combinations would be the amount of combinations that can make up a, a certain hand value and the distinct combinations are actually the distinct values that we need to consider for the hand evaluation. So we can see at the bottom of the table, we can simplify the overall amount of combinations from 2.5 million to only 7.500. So that is, we only have 7.500 cases to consider for our hand evaluation. We'll use this knowledge later on when we're building our evaluator function. But for now, let's look at a second problem that we need to figure out. How are we going to represent a card in our code? A naive approach would be to use 13 bits four times. Basically 13 bits, and each of them represents a card rank. We do this four times, and then we can encode a whole card. So let's take, for example, this representation. As we can see, we have 52 bits, and one of them is set to a 1. All the others are zeros. So in this case, we could define this to be the two of clubs. And similarly, if you look at another card where a bit is flipped in a different position, this could be the ace of hearts. So when we look at this approach, we see that we can relatively simply encode a full hand in 52 bits by just binary oring all the five cards together so that we end up with 52 bits where five bits are set to one. Counting multiple occurrences of the same rank is somewhat inefficient though, and detecting a flash is also quite expensive in terms of the operations that are required to do so. And furthermore, one card and uh, one hand do not fit into a 32-bit integer respectively, which may decrease the performance. So let's look at a different approach. What if, instead of taking 13 bits four times, we just take 13 bits and four bits 13 bits still represent the ranks, but the 4 bits now represent the suit of the card. Going back to our earlier example, the 2 of clubs would be represented like this. We have the 2 bit set and the club bit set, right? That is the 2 of clubs. And similarly, if we look at this representation, we have the ace bit set and we have the heart bit set, so obviously it is the ace of hearts. If we look at the situation with a 7 bit approach, we can see that we cannot encode a hand in 17 bits by just using the binary ors on the cards uh, as we did previously with the 52-bit approach. Detecting a flush is now relatively efficient as we only have to look at 4 bits. And uh, if the operation to replace the binary or encoding could be uh, just used on the cards, we can just uh, keep this representation. Counting multiple occurrences of the same rank is still inefficient though. And we have uh, an approach that would at least work for the 32 bit integers for one card. Depending on how we replace the uh, encoding of five hand cards into a hand, we may or may not have an approach that would work with representing a hand in 32 bits. 
Now, since both these approaches are not really suited uh, perfectly well, let's take a step back and uh, look at our requirements once again. We need a representation that allows us to identify flashes. Flashes are an important part of detecting the hand strength of uh, a given five card combination. Furthermore, we need to know how many of a given card rank are in the hand in order to be able to identify, say, four of a kind, two of a kind, three of a kind, uh, full houses, and so forth. And optionally, we would also like to encode a whole hand into 32 bits. Now, if we look at what we've learned so far, we know that uh, treating suits and ranks individually may be a sensible approach since uh, we have card combinations that use the same ranks, but depending on the suits that are involved, we end up with a stronger hand or a weaker hand. And similarly, for a lot of uh, hands that are in the same uh, hand value, the ranks are the only important deciding factors. We also know that the order of the cards in the hand is not important. That is to say, the cards are commutative uh, and with respect to the hand that they're forming. We need to define how cards are added together to create a hand uh, in order to find a representation that allows us to do this operation efficiently. Now, when I implemented this poker hand evaluator, I thought long and hard about this, but I want to save you uh, the time and basically show you the approach that I ended up using to encode hands and cards. I remembered that there's a thing called the unique factorization theorem. Basically, it states that any integer bigger than one is either a prime or can be represented as a product of primes. That means we have a unique combination of factors in any given product and ignoring the order, the product that they represent is unique. Changing any of the factors or how often the factor appears in the combination ends up producing a different number. So if we consider our hand the product of primes and our card ranks the individual primes in that product, we can use uh, this definition and come up with a representation that is far more efficient than the ones that we've looked at so far. Basically, what I ended up doing when encoding a card I assigned each rank a unique prime value. So for example, for the rank of a 2, I assigned the value of 2. For the rank of 3, I assigned the value of 3, and so on and so forth, until we end up with the ace, which is assigned the value of 41. And what we can then do is we can use 27 and 4 bits to represent any given card. The first 27 bits are used to store the rank's prime value, and the last 4 bits are used to store the suit as previously. So we end up with a representation that uh, looks somewhat like this. If we go back to our example cards, we will see that the two of clubs is now represented by its prime value and the suit bit. So our 27 bits here end up representing uh, 10 and the suit bit is set to a club, leading us to encoding the two of clubs. Looking at the other example from previously, we have the representation of the ace of hearts. So the hearts bit is set and our 27 bits at the beginning show uh, the value of 41 ace of hearts. So how do we encode a hand? Uh, well, we multiply just all of the five prime values to get the product that we were talking about earlier. And we binary all, all of the five suit values. So, for example, if we take a look at the hand that we used previously, if we wanted to encode this one, we would end up with something like this. We see that all of the suit bits are set, since all of the suits are represented in this hand, and the value that we get uh, for the prime product is just the product of the ranks involved. You might wonder, why are we using 27 bits? Isn't that a lot of wasted space? Well, it turns out that the highest combination or the highest value that we can create is just four aces and the king, and that just happens to be 27 bits long in binary. So now that we know how to represent a card and a hand, how can we actually do efficient lookups with this information? Well, given the four bits for the suits, we can detect a flush, and that one should be fairly straightforward. And given the 27-bit value for the rank, we can implement a lookup based on the value that we 
uh, able to compute. If we look at a naive approach of how to implement the lookup, we could uh, consider indexing the values in an array. So for example, at array index zero, we wouldn't have a value defined as we cannot get zero as the possible representation of a hand. Similar goes for one and so on and so forth. So the lowest value that we would actually, uh, the lowest index at which we would actually determine the value of a certain hand would be the index that is shown here, which is 48. We would end up uh, putting the actual hand, the absolute hand value of these hands that we see here at the specific indices. And by doing so, we would have an array that has a minimum length of about 100 million, since this is the value of the highest combination that can be uh, produced. And only 7,462 values are defined as we identified previously. So that leads us to uh, a constant lookup time of uh, about one operation, because we just look at the value of the array index. But we're not very space efficient. Ideally, we would have a constant lookup time uh, and a better space efficiency. So the next thing that I considered to improve the approach was to use a hash function. Now, I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but consider a hash function as a function that takes an arbitrary length input and outputs a fixed length output. Uh, in theory, hash functions uh, can produce collisions, that is when a distinct key gets mapped to the same hash. Uh, Hash functions are usually used in a hash table where given the key, we produce the hash using the hash function and then uh, we get a hash value back. And that hash value encodes all the entries that uh, happen to be in this category. So let's say we're encoding a key 123. Our hash function spits out the value n and then uh, there we can find the hand strength of uh, the given combination. Now, in practice, we would uh, see a lot of hash collisions here. So that is, we would have keys where there are multiple entries uh, stored in the same what's called bucket. That would be the n's and the m's here. Now, the more entries you have per bucket, the slower the lookup will be. Uh, as first you have to compute the hash, and then you would have to filter through the entries to actually find the one that you were looking for. So for a hash table, the properties that we can define or identify are the worst case search time is O of n. That is, if all the entries map to the same bucket, we just end up with an array that has n items, and then we would have to filter through it. However, we are very space efficient. We only use about uh, the same amount of uh, uh, space uh, that we have entries on average which is much better than the utilization that we got uh, using the array. The goal would be to combine the best of the two approaches. That is, we would want to have a lookup that is both space and time efficient. In order to do that, we would have to find a hash function that produces no collisions. The challenge would be to map our 7462 values to a distinct key each. If we consider this finite set of inputs, we definitely know that a collision-free hash function must exist. For example, I could just count up from 1 to 7,462 and assign each value uh, a unique integer, and then that would be uh, a hash function that would guarantee it produce no collisions. But building that hash function might be very tricky. Uh, using a hash table with a perfect hash function, we would eliminate the need for buckets. We would only ever have one entry per hash that is possible, and thus giving us uh, a guaranteed lookup time that is comparable to the array approach. What would this look like in practice? We would have a constant lookup time, as just outlined, and we would have a very space efficient approach, even though it's not guaranteed to be optimal, as we could still have some potential outputs of our hash function that we just don't happen to use. That is our hash function given an input that is not part of the 7,462 uh, values that we have, uh, could in theory produce another, uh, another output. So we would have to have a bucket in place 
or uh, a slot in space for, for, for this uh, in memory. Now the last optimization that uh, is fairly obvious uh, that we uh, could identify is to reduce or eliminate the wasted spaces. And if we are successful in eliminating all the empty spaces that are not used, we would end up with what's called a minimal hash table with a perfect hash. That is, we get a constant lookup time and optimal space efficiency as we could e map each key to only one uh, entry and there is no entries that are not mapped to. We're not going to go too much into detail, but rest assured that there are people that are far smarter than uh, I am that have researched these topics and designed algorithms that, given the input and the desired output values, uh, these algorithms would be able to compute a minimal uh, hash table using a perfect hash function. And this is exactly what I did. So let's take a look of how we are going to put everything together. The first thing that we have to do on initialization of our code is to enumerate all our hand value classes. Since those are only 7400 values and some of them are repeated, this is a fairly stra straightforward and efficient process. As you can see, in the place where you would expect the straight flushes, we just have the straights. And in the place where we would expect the flushes, we have the non-pairs or high cards. Uh, this is due to the fact that the prime product uh, is the, sim is, uh, the same for, for these combinations, the only difference being the property of uh, having a flush or not. Secondly, after we have all these ranks and the individual possible combinations, we compute the distinct values of each uh, combination. As we can see, the value is just derived by multiplying all the values in hand together and then the actual rank that we're assigning top to bottom just increases. So uh, a lower number means a stronger hand. Uh, in this case, we're also storing whether or not the combination has a pair for the next step, which is initializing our lookup table. Um, basically, we will use two lookup tables, one for flushes and one for non-flushes. Since some of the values that we're using to index in these are uh, repeated and you can't have repeated values if you want to have perfect space efficiency and the perfect hash. Therefore we are going to enumerate over all of the prime products uh, that we have and based on whether or not the combination that we're looking at has a pair or has a rank that is higher than any flush possible we will write the value and the rank into the non-flushes object and otherwise if we have a flush we will write it into the flush object. From there, we will create two perfect, uh, two minimal perfect hashes, one for non-flushes and one for flushes. And at the lookup time, our lookup function basically takes a look at the key that is presented, determines if the key belongs to a flush hand or a non-flush hand, and then does the lookup in the minimal perfect hash table to get the actual hand rank. So now let's uh, take a look at it in action. First of all, we require a package that contains the evaluator, we instantiate a new instance of the evaluator, and we also export the uh, ranks from uh, the evaluator package to a shorthand property. If we take a look at the ranks, we can see that each card rank is assigned an individual prime value. Now this allows us to, for example, construct our hand that contains four aces and one king. So now we have a value that is around 100 million and looking at this value in binary, we can see that this is actually, as we previously saw on the slide, 27 bits long. As we can see, this is the binary representation. Now in order to make a full hand, uh, we also need to take into consideration the suits. So what we will do in this hand, since we have four different suits being used, we will set four bits for the suits. We have to shift these uh, to the front as the evaluator uses the four bits uh, at the front of the, uh, the four highest bits of the uh, concatenation here to determine the suits. And this will give us some number. And we can then put this number into our evaluator and we should see that indeed four aces and a king is the 11th strongest hand. Now, if we want to see the strongest hand, we can, for example, take a look at uh, 
a royal flush in one of the suits which basically means only one suit is set and then we have the ace the king the queen the jack and the 10 of this rank and we would expect this to be the strongest hand possible also we can take a look at the lowest hand possible so the lowest hand possible will definitely use all of the suits and then the lowest cards that we can make so we start off from the bottom with a two and a three a four a five and since if we were to add a six we would get a straight we would need to use the seven now if we look at this we actually get 7462 which is well in line with our expectation of having 7462 different classes one last example that we can take a look at is the hand from our initial example uh, if we remember it was a hand that used an ace and used a 10 a pair of fours and a seven so let's quickly build this hand and see what the actual rank of it is. And as we can see, the value that we had on the slide initially is the actual hand rank. Its hand rank is 5555. And so we end this presentation. I want to say a big thanks for watching and stay safe in these times. May the cards be with you.